welcome to the D3 D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another D3 D4 Football Podcast Extra. Today, I am delighted to be joined by a man who reached three playoff semi finals with Tramir Rovers, who reached the Premier League with Ipswich Town and was part of that George Burley side that finished fifth. Yes, that right, Ipswich fans, fifth in the top flight. Uh, a man who has had a great success in his four-year stint at Colchester as a manager. Last season, taking a League Two side to the quarter-final of the League Cup, as well as finishing sixth and finishing um, his tenure there with 76 wins. Not bad at all. It is, of course, John McGreal. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for your time today. Good afternoon. How are you? OK? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, how are you doing after... Uh, you know, having a bit of a break from the game for the first time in, in quite some time. It is, yeah. Um, it's a little bit difficult, really. Now I've stepped out of it. I've enjoyed the break. You know, don't get me wrong. Obviously, um, my son went to university a couple of years ago and then I've just seen my daughter off in university around September time. So that was nice to get to do that. And then um, we actually moved house in between um, from when I, you know, left Colchester to where we are now. So that's kept me busy. Um, but yeah, it's one where, you know, you, you still got that desire to try and get yourself back involved in the game. Oh, absolutely. And looking at your CV, I'm sure you'll have people queuing around the block to uh, to hire you, if I'm honest. But let's start at the beginning, because, of course, you grew up a Liverpool fan. I can see from the shirt behind you uh, that, uh, I assume that's Robbie Fowler, I can see, written on the yeah, back of it. Yeah, Robbie yeah so you're a big, big Liverpool fan, um, but your first club that you joined as a professional was Tranmere Rovers, am I right? That's correct, yeah. And I actually remember those years quite well, because obviously I was growing up watching a lot of it. Uh, my dad and me, both Oxford United fans, you had a certain John Aldridge uh, <laughs> yeah. at Tranmere in those days, and uh, yeah. that was that was some Tranmere team though, wasn't it? I mean, if I remember rightly, um, you had Eric Nixon in goal, yeah, I think Liam O'Brien was was a centre back at the club at the it's time. Back, yeah, uh, myself, uh, Sean Garnett, um, Pat Ian Nevin, Nolan, Pat Nevin, Tony, Tony Thomas, Kenny Hines, uh, Jim Brannan. Yeah. Um, oh, geez, who else? So you're obviously John Aldridge, Ian Muir, um, you know Chris Malkin. Yeah. So uh, we were, you know, we had a really good, talented, you know, four four two system at times, and you know. Um, God rest his soul, Johnny King, the gaffer at the time. We, we did play a three-five-two at times, but uh, yeah, there was gold, gold, gold's abundance in that team. You know, especially with your John Aldridge's and you know your Pat Nevins, to mention a few. Yeah, I remember the team was always exciting to watch going forward. Um, one, yeah, one thing I remember though, it, it was those three consecutive years, wasn't it? It was ninety-three, ninety-four, and ninety-five. You made it to playoff semi-finals, losing to Swindon, Leicester. And then Reading, my uncle is a Reading fan, so that for him was that season uh, of huge regret because, of course, they lost to Bolton in the final when the Premier League was actually decreasing in size. So they finished, I think they finished second and would have gone up in any other year, uh, but they didn't manage to do it that year. Um, how, how was that as a, as a squad mentality to, to get to three playoff semi-finals but not ever get further? It was tough, don't get me wrong. Obviously, we, we knew we could score goals. Um, I, I'm thinking back, I know it's a long time, but I think our away form wasn't overly the best in either one of them years um, where we, we should have you know, at, at least got to the finals um, in them playoffs. But we just tended to lose in the semi-finals. You know? and I think the last one, Reading, we lost the home leg first. Um, I think it was 3-1 or something like that. Um, and I've actually went, got the programme in a draw somewhere here from the from the leg at Reading yeah and I think yeah it was Elm Park going back all them years ago um, I think we drew nil nil but I think again that evening we had unbelievable chances to score um, to try and get the, the tie back level but unfortunately it didn't work out and as you alluded to before Reading went on to lose that final as well um, so yeah it was one where you know a couple of years on the run we always just we just a confident team we knew you know, even though we were a young team, a, a lot of scouts were in the team as well. Um, we knew we could, you know, on any given day, we could beat anyone. And, and you know, the team spirit amongst Tranmere was, was, was fantastic. You know, from the older players, from as you alluded to there, you know, Eric Nixon to your John Aldridge's, but, you know, Johnny King, the gaffer at the time, had a lovely blend of youth 
in that squad as well, and a lot of grit and a lot of flair as well. So uh, it, it balanced off really well. Yeah, it's it super. I mean, I remember it's super. I mean, was it a tactic you had? I might be thinking of someone else, but I have a feeling that when you defended corners, John Aldridge liked to keep like four players forward on the halfway line. Didn't um, do that often. I, you know what? Again, you're testing my memory here, by the way. Um, <laughs> what we had to do was literally get make first contact. So again, you know, going back to uh, the tactical side of it, it was just literally, you know, the old adage years ago, my man for man, um, you pick him up and if he scores, it's your fault. And that was how, you know, the responsibilities we were given from, you know, Johnny King was, you know, deal with the man you're being given. Um, on the other side, John Aldridge wouldn't be like, Sticking in his own 18-yard box, defending, no no chance. He'd want to be up the other end for a, a counter-attack to get himself scoring the goals like he did. I think one year, I think he scored 40 goals or something like that one season, which is unbelievable thinking back. I think he was, you know, early 30s at the time as well. Oh, he was a terrific, he was a terrific player. Was um, yeah. Oxford loved him. You know, he, he was part of player. our best era as a, as a club. Um, yeah. um, unfortunately, I was, I was born in 80, 85, so I just missed out on those on those years but uh, yeah. you know they, we were we were a pretty good side in fact you joined Ipswich Town in 1999 didn't you it was a very sudden move apparently you know from what I've read you you were literally told by John Aldridge there's been a bid and I thought you yeah. thought you were going to go to Huddersfield but actually it was, yeah it was it was surreal because throughout that summer um my roommate at the time Kenny Irons he went to Huddersfield um so we'd gone just beforehand and then obviously we kept in touch and I think Steve Bruce was the manager at the time. And I think there was little bits of links that I was, you know, potentially going there. And, you know, as a player, you leave everything to your agents. You know, you know, even now, nowadays, I don't think that's changed as much. So um, when John Aldridge, the gaffer at the time, pulled me, I think it was on a Tuesday, Tuesday morning or something like that, as we were gearing up for, for the first game of the season, um, he just said the club had accepted the bid and, the club was going through a bit of a tough time at the time, financial-wise, um, Tramia. So it was one where, you know, I got the curly finger to say, you know, you need to get yourself. I said, OK. I said, you know, what club is it? When he said Ipswich, I was like, Ipswich? You know, quite surprised, really. Um, but knowing fully well what Ipswich had done previous, they, I think they had missed out on three or four playoffs as well themselves prior to, you know, when I went in the 1999-2000 season. So uh, I was in my car. There was no question. I was in my car on a Wednesday morning, um, travelled all the way down, had a brilliant chat with, with the gaffer, George Bailey, um, and literally I signed, I signed a contract within an hour as such, you know, passed me medical, um, and then picked up the training on the Thursday, Friday, and then played Nottingham Forest on a Saturday. Um They'd just been relegated, I think, and I think we beat them 3 1, and it was, you know, a fantastic start to me to his career. What a fantastic start it was to your career. I mean, yeah. you consider that you got promoted uh, in that first season. I mean, you had some players. I mean, one I will talk about a little bit is Jim McJilton, because he, he was my yeah. first, as, a, as an Oxford fan, he was the first yeah. kind of player that I was like, he's our key man, he's our best player. And obviously, yeah. devastated in 94 when he was. was Pinched, I say, by Southampton for a very <laughs> modest fee. Um, but you know what a what a great player he was. But you had something. You had Tony Mowbray in that uh, in that team. Um, yeah, Mark you had, Venus, you know, Mark Venus, again, yeah. the gaffer George at the time. He had a lovely blend of you know flair players, but again, he had that that knit and grit. You know that determination and um, you know wanting to keep clean sheets. Obviously, we had Richard White in goal, who was an up and coming you know fantastic player. Went on to play for England and you know Arsenal to mention a few um, but again <clears throat> you know Jimmy Gilton and at that time George used to just pick you know a handful of plays that we just needed that little bit of you know that little bit of guile you know Martin Roosters and Marcus Stewart coming towards the end of that season just to get us over the line really um, mm. you know and, and they proved to be fantastic signings for the club as well Oh absolutely I mean it's funny though because you nearly missed the player final didn't you because you'd had an injury and yeah. Yeah, you know. it was. Yeah, it, I'd been injured for about six weeks. Um, I'd done my ankle at Stockport. Um, I'd done it in training. I had a, an obvious challenge with James Goldcroft in, in training, and me, my ankle just blew up. Um, so I'd missed two weeks. Um, I got I rushed back myself really because I thought I don't want to. You know, I've come all the way to Ipswich. I want to be a big part of the playoff push, if not the top two push at the time. 
Um, and I'd come back a little bit too early, to be honest. Stockport away, and again, me, me ankle just went on me. Um, I think we ended up winning the game 1 0, but I had to come off. And um, I was injured then up until, you know, the playoff final. And I always remember um, watching the semi finals, it was painful. I remember we watched it was, uh, Walsall, I think it was, on the last day of the season. We beat them. I think we had still an opportunity of going in the top two. Obviously, it didn't work. We then played Bolton. Um, and there was always, I think the year before or whatever, I think it was the year before, they had that little bit of a run in or whatever. Um, and we knew it'd be a really tough game because the two games we played that season with them were really tight. Um, and again, as you mentioned before, you know, Marcus Stewart away from home was fantastic. You know, a couple of great goals. And Jimmy Jung at home, you know, become a, a legend status for his hat-trick that he scored in that, in that semi-final. And then... I always remember it. We all, you know, we were in the stands, ran down um, into the changing room to see the guys afterwards. And I just remember the gaffer George just pulling me, saying, "Are you going to be fit for the final?" And the final then was, I think it was about two and a half weeks, three weeks. Um, and I was like, "Gaffer, yeah, I'll be fit for the final." And he, you know, true to his words, um, he put me straight in. And you know, the rest is history. We go on to win the game four two. Yeah, four two. I forgot that Craig Higner actually played for for Barnsley in those days because he was a great player for for Middlesbrough, obviously, and he scored that yeah. cracking goal with with a slight uh, aid of uh, yeah, off righty, yeah, off righty, yeah, yeah, that's right. But you guys came back strong. Nader had a great final, didn't he, up front for you? He, he... It was brilliant. It was yeah, it was unfortunate for Jono. He got injured. I think he pulled his calf um, not too soon in the final, and then Bam Bam come on as sub, and he, he changed the game. He just you know he, he roughed it their back four up, um, and him and Marcus Stewart, you know, the partnership on that day was, was superb. You know, the you know, the balance off the pair of them was excellent and gave us that, you know, that edge up top really. You went into the Premier League surely not thinking about what would unfold. I mean, it was it was ridiculous. I mean, a team like Ipswich, you know, these are the Premier League days. I mean, I think the four teams that finished above you, obviously Manchester United, I think, won the league that year with Arsenal second. Uh, but you fit you finished fifth. I mean, that's unbelievable achievement. Because the Premier League has changed football. I mean, we used to see fairly regularly teams like Notts Forest and Watford, of course, had a, yeah. that spell where they were right up there. But it doesn't happen so often now. We're, we're quite amazed, like when Leicester win the Premier League, it's a global phenomenon now. Yeah. Whereas yeah. before, it, it was still a big thing, but it wasn't quite a big a shot. But Ipswich Town, back in that season, I mean, you were absolutely brilliant. Uh, you, of course, scored a goal. I think it was that season you scored the goal against Everton? It was, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um <laughs> Again, just to, I mentioned it earlier earlier on before we come on air. It was like the, probably the most nervous I've ever been. Obviously, played in the playoff final, and we knew that day going into that final we were going to win. We were just super confident. Um, and but going to Everton was a you know a totally different you know kettle of fish. Um, big big club. Obviously, going back home, a lot of family friends at, at Liverpool. Um, a couple of friends, you know. Um, you know, used to go to Anfield on occasionally, but a, a majority of my Evertonian friends all used to go to the game religiously, week in, week out, and mm. you know, be in the Gladys Street. And luckily enough, um, we won the game three 0 I got the first goal, the header in the Gladys Street, um, and the abuse and the stick it took <laughs> off my mates alone that evening <laughs> was, <laughs> was uh, a little bit uncalled for at times. But it goes with the banter of the game. It was uh, one of the best feelings ever. In you know. Um, in football that I've ever ever had really scoring against Everton. Is is what what would you say is um you've had a great career, but I mean what would you say was the the pinnacle? Was it that goal at Everton or was it the playoff final win? Oh, you know what? The, the, yeah, it's difficult. And also we won one nil at Anfield as well that year. Um which so yeah, I think that that moment it'd have to be the playoff final. There's no question of it. I think you know the, the couple of years hair tips Richard had you know, of getting to the semi-finals, getting knocked out. And I think that year, um, we were just super confident. And I think, you know, that was the thing. And that, I think winning that final also gave us that that, impact, that push for then that Premier League season that we had. So uh, the momentum from that final actually took us into the Premier League as well. So I'd say that final was probably the best. Now, the next season, 
you you got relegated. Uh, and it's not actually uncommon, is it, for a team like no, the Sink with no. Sheffield United this year? Yeah. You know, wonderful season last year, struggling with sort of Reading when they finished very high up in, in the Premier League and then Steve Coppleside obviously went down the next year. You know, uh, being part of it as, a, as a, also as a manager, but, um, you know, as a player, what do you think makes it so difficult for sides in their second year after being promoted to the Premier League? You know what? I don't know because I'm looking. I'm, you know, I still watch the game, the Premier League games. I look at Sheffield United, and you know they haven't really changed that much personnel. You're looking at the shape. The shape seems to be the same. Obviously, we changed the personnel because again, um, we were in Europe at the time as well with Ipswich. So we, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, we were in Europe. So you know, with, with being obviously being successful, finishing fifth, we got that European run. So you know, I think we, you know thinking we could improve, you know, maybe not our position in the Premier League, but, you know, we wanted to consolidate our Premier League, but also try and fight on the uh, the European front. And it didn't work. I think the Thursday, Sunday games, I think, if I'm going back, uh, was quite tough, you know, uh, was really tough to play on the Thursday, to then go again on the Sunday. Um, we didn't really have the biggest squad. We had quite a few new members of, you know, players coming into the squad as well. And, you know, maybe it didn't gel as quick as what we'd liked. But um, I do remember it being a little bit of a toil that Thursday, Sunday, um, you know, from the success that we'd had the year before where we are just playing sailing. I think we actually got to the semi-finals of the, the Carling Cup as well the year before and got beat by Birmingham. So we've been successful, successful. And I think, you know, everyone just seemed to be thinking we're just going to have that success again. But as we all know, the Premier League doesn't let anyone take your foot off the gas because, uh, you no, know, it's, not. it's absolutely ruthless. And you know, we have to look now at what's happening to Sheffield United after the fantastic season they had, you know, last season. It, it's a, you know, that this is going back 20 years ago. It's a tough, tough league. Indeed. I mean, you talk about your European campaign. You actually beat Inter Milan in the first leg at Portman Road, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I didn't play. Um but yeah, we beat them 1-0, um, Alan Armstrong, and um, it was unbelievable. Again, you're talking about European nights. That was, you know, one of the nights to, to remember, even, you know, not being, not playing, you know, but watching it and watching the fans, you know, um, for what from where we'd come from as such, you know, the year before to where we were. Um, and then we went away. And um, I think it was 4-1. It might have been 4-1. 4-1, one, yeah. Yeah, 4-1 away. But the, again, the fans... The European tour, um, the Ipswich fans, wherever it was, were in the numbers. I mean, they were they followed us everywhere. And I'm, I'll just think back to Inter Milan. I think they had the whole top tier from, you know, from side to side, from top to bottom. Um, yeah. It was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we lost the game 4-1. But, uh, yeah, great memories for everyone. I'm sure, absolutely. Obviously, your time at Ipswich uh, came to an end not long after and you ended up going to Burnley for three years. At that stage when you're at Burnley, obviously you, you were described as the best centre-back in the Championship by a couple of people during that era. But were you thinking about what you wanted to do after the game at this point? Because it was coming to the sort of the end of your career. You'd have a, had a few injury problems. When did you start sort of thinking? Because I know Jim Bajilt was the, the sort of the character who persuaded you to take your badges. Yeah. But had you thought about it prior to that? You know what? I hadn't, honestly. You know, it was literally... Um... I went, you know, I didn't really want to leave Ipswich, but unfortunately, you know, uh, negotiating contracts and stuff like that, and um, it didn't work out. It was one where, you know, um, under Joe Royal, they were only offering part contracts and certain things. And um, and then I'd had a really good last six months to the season at Ipswich where they'd gone from not being in the playoffs. And then when we were playing, we got to the playoffs. And then, you know, as you said there, I pulled my calf in the first leg against West Ham. I think we won the first leg 1-0 and then I pulled my calf and I missed the second leg and we got beat um, and got knocked out. So then obviously my contract was up and it wasn't what I was looking for. So obviously you, you, you tend to look somewhere else. And well, Burnley offered you a three-year deal, didn't they? Which, you know, that's not to be sniffed at. Yeah, I remember speaking with Peter Reid and Adrian Heath. They were at Coventry at the time and I think the agent was speaking to another couple of clubs. Um, but Steve Cottrell at the time, you know, he was he made it clear that um, he, wa I, he wanted me to be his first sign and he wanted to take over, you know, a different way of Burnley, how he wanted to go about things. And he was hoping that, you know, making me as a sign would then, you know, attract other players and also give him what he, he needs to start off. And 
he just won me over. There's no question about it. He won me over and, um, you know, I had a good three years. But I, even in them three years, I didn't think about management at all. I just wanted to concentrate on football. I was 32. Um, I wanted to stay fit from, I think, the the year before with Ipswich. I'd missed four months, five months with a back and a knee injury. Um, and then I come back fit. And then I barely... I just got myself super fit in that off season. Um, obviously, I was staying in the hotel at times while, I, you know, the wife and kids down here was sorting out, you know, selling the house and dotting the eyes and crossing the t's. Um, and I played, I think a lot. I think forty odd games. I think I played that season for. Barely. Yeah, so it's amazing. You, you literally played every match, pr- pretty much. Yeah, and I think there's at the most, you know, the the, the squad we were, we were a really tough nut to crack. And I think when you had the likes of Robbie Blake up top. Um, you always could nick a goal and Tony Grant in midfield you know Frank Sinclair alongside me and if Frank went to right back or left back you had Michael Duff you know we were still keeping in touch with now as a good Michael Duff, yeah yeah I've seen a photo of you winning a winning yeah. a header with Michael Duff standing in the background I thought what a yeah, set of back pairing you know, that is and then obviously Steve uh, Cottrell the gaffer at the time brought in Gary Cale very early on in that first season when I was at Burnley and you know, only have to now look at you know, the experience Gary had around him, like myself and Frank, uh, Frank Sinclair, you know, you're looking at Gary Cale now, he, he's been one of the proper centre-halves throughout the last 10, 15 years in a way, you know, he's had a fantastic career. In, yeah, in definitely, yes, yeah. So, Steve, you know, the gaffer then could, you know, make an eye for a player as well at that time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, obviously, once you, you left Burnley, you, you moved back down towards Ipswich, you said you had yeah. like, some business interest down there, but... You then had this, this meeting with Jim Jilton where he said, you know, why don't you, why don't you get your badges? Why don't you go and, and, and do your, your way for badges? Was, yeah, it was, um, obviously, he was, he was the gaffer at the time at Ipswich. Um, I'd moved back down and uh, there was rumours that he was trying to get me to sign and this, that, and the other. But I was 35 and I think my body had been, you know, through enough and I was looking to possibly stay in the game. Um, you know, went over, actually went over to Colchester at the time for the trial under George Williams and uh, that didn't work out in a way, but I knew my body was 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 finished, and fortunate, you know, I was very fortunate to get to 35 as well to play. So I went down and watched a lot of games with Jim. Um, I was watching the games, and you know, we, we, we'd have a beer in his office after the game, and we'd talk about you know the game and stuff. And he just said, "Go, come in, invite you in, make you know, get your hours, get your badges done." And the rest is history. Um, I remember Jared Nash, he's still there now. Jared Nash, he was doing the under 18s at the time, under 16s, under 18s. Um, he invited me in, you know, got me badges. He's mm. still there now doing the 23s in the first team. So, again, you know, a major thanks to him, really, to giving up his time. And it just went, you know, hand in hand. I'd, I'd been out the game for about six months. I was watching games, but I weren't really in it. I had a couple of business ventures down here. But then when it's in, yeah. The football, it's very hard to get out of you. Um, and the more games you're watching, and the more you're getting on the grass again, and being involved in around players, you just it just comes in, in, into your system again, really. Well, you clearly you're a great leader as a player, and I think that has put you in great stead to be an excellent coach and, and subsequently an excellent manager. Because of course, you know you see all these young players, and Colchester is an archetypal team, isn't it, of bringing through and giving a great pathway to young yeah. players into the first team. You must have been, you must have thrived in that environment, giving all your advice and all those years of playing to, to these young players. Well, it, it, I think what put me in a good step was I started off doing the you know the the young boys, which like the under thirteens, under fifteens, um, and that was all like part time, and that was also a little bit for me as well to see whether I really you know wanted to go into the coaching side of the things, because um, as I said before, I'd never really thought about coaching or you know becoming a manager, but it's in you and that's that's the thing if it's in you you know you want to come out and express it and the more I started getting on the grass coaching the more day to day with the players and even at Colchester you know it's not only a pathway for the kids coming through there's a pathway there for coaches you know and you know you're looking at me that's gone from under 13s 15s into the first team you're looking at Steve Ball now who's done exactly very similar and um, work with the school first of all school has gone on to the 18s 23s and now first team so you know, it's a fantastic club to give, you know, people and players opportunity. So uh, the more I was doing the coaching and the more age groups I was stepping up to, the more then you start becoming into your own, really. And 
um, when you become then the full time and dealing with 18s, 23s, and you're seeing now your 18 year olds getting picked for first team squads and after them playing in the first team, you know, you're thinking this is, you know, it's a lot more productive. You look, you, you know, you, you're actually having an impact on young players' careers and you're watching them develop as players, you know, into the first team environment. And that's, you know, a joy as well, really. I can imagine. And, you know, the thing that, you, you must have done something right. You were there for four years. Now, it doesn't sound long for someone like me who used to see managers last, you know, maybe a decade. But in modern football, four years, I think you were like the fifth or sixth longest serving manager in, in the EFL or, or the 92 in the English Football League. So, you know, you were, you were really doing an excellent job. And obviously getting uh, Colchester, I think, progressing, I'd say, year on year. Um, yeah. And then last season was just unbelievable. Um, you know, I, I was there when you beat Crawley um, before yeah. going on to the Man U. But actually before that, you'd knocked out Crystal Palace, Premier League side. And, and knocking out Premier League side, I think, is even bigger than it ever used to be because there's such a big gap now between yeah. the Premier League sides. And then Tottenham. I mean, what a night that must have been. And then you got to go to Old Trafford, the quarterfinal. Obviously, you know, you, d- you didn't beat them, but it was a, it was a wonderful occasion for the club. Um, just just describe how how you feel about that last season there. I mean, it was it was a bit of was, work, was it? It was it was unbelievable. Honestly, you know, when you think back now, what, when you're in the midst of it, you don't really have time to think because the games come thick and fast. Um, but when you you come out of it and you realise, you know, what the team had done, what the club had done, mm. um, even starting off like we we had Swindon at home in our first get in the first um, Carabao Cup game. Um, and Swindon at the time were, were, were flying and actually went on to win the league. And, you know, they were the best team in our division last year, Swindon, under Richie Wellens. So we beat them at home 3-0, I think it was. Um, and then obviously we got the tie at Crystal Palace. And then you're thinking they can throw anyone in here. You know, I used to Yazahas to Gary Cale played, um, you know, Kelly, you know, they could throw in anyone. And to be fair to them, it was nil-nil. And then after an hour... They put all the big guns on um, to try and get that win to not go into you know the penalty shootout and stuff. Um, but fortunately for us, I think Gerks made the first penalty shootout save, and then uh, we had a you know a young a, a academy graduate, you know Noah Chilvers, who now is playing you know um, this season, who you know gave his debut last year. He scored the winning penalty against Crystal Palace. Yeah, what a story! So, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, mm. unbelievable feeling for that young boy at that time, and you know again. Um, he's going on to bigger and better things this season, but that was, brought, you know, a big part of his um, progression as a, as a player. And then, obviously, right in thinking, then did we get the Tottenham game after Palace? I think it was, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah the Tottenham yeah. game, and then that was just, you know, you, you try and prep, you know, for your Palace games away, but then you, you're looking at Tottenham, they're beating. Champions League finalists, you know, beaten by Liverpool um, in the main, you're thinking, you know, Pochettino was an unbelievable coach and you're watching them week in, week out and you're just trying to nullify what they've got really by trying to get men behind the ball. But uh, he underestimated John McGrill though, didn't he? Yeah, no, I don't know about <laughs> that. The, the team, the effort the lads put in that night was unbelievable, honestly. The amount of running, the tackles, the last-ditch last tackles and then... We grew in the game, to be honest. You know, the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes, um, we got a little bit more of a foothold in the game. Um, and then, obviously, it went into the, you know, the penalties. And again, you know, Gerks made a, made a save. And um, Giovanni made, a, you know, a bit of a hash of his penalty to make us, you know, a lot more safer. But then another academy graduate, Tom Lapsley, um, scored the winning penalty, you know. And then you just see the, the mayhem and the chaos of, you know, all the fans coming onto the pitch, you know, there's just over 10,000. It was packed. I think, you know, going back, I think the club was saying they could have easily have sold that, you know, the the, the game over two or three times, you know, yeah. there was that much demand for the tickets. And it was an unbelievable night for the football club. Unbelievable night. It's, and what, then, it's, what, yeah. it's what those nights are for. Isn't it? I mean, this is, you yeah. know, we, we all support, I mean, I'm an Oxford fan and we've had many years of hardship, but I think every supporter who supports their local side rather than, you know, supporting, say, a bigger club, they, these are the nights that make it worth it. Those are the nights that you will remember as a Colchester fan. Those Colchester fans will remember that forever, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it's, and it's a memory that you've given them, which is absolutely terrific. And I think, you know, that people underestimate, um, and part of the reason why we start D3, D4, people underestimate the quality of football in the English pyramid, especially in leagues one and two, they kind of don't 
really get much coverage uh, mm. and we've tried to sort of boost that but you know yeah. one thing we're noticing is the, the actual quality of football um, seems to go up every year and it's so it is without a shadow of a doubt there's some talented boys in uh, division one and division two obviously i've been the mainstay of division two really and there's some really talented um players in that and not only that some talented coaches you know you're looking at week in week out you know coaches now are applying different tactics to try and win games of football and there's a lot more thought process going into a lot more analysis going into it um, a lot more in-depth detail going into games and you know you 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 can say you can say you've seen that as well over the number of years you know the, the it is definitely improved massive yeah I mean, you, you finished sixth, you went to the, you won the first leg of the, of the playoffs and then went to St. James's Park and we've seen Exeter this season destroy yeah. Colchester, actually one of the teams they destroyed, but they, they've done it to a couple of teams this season. Very difficult place to go. But really, it was a very close game. You were a Kwame well, Poku chance yeah. away from winning it in the last minute. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we didn't start well. Obviously, the first leg, um, you know, it was a really tight affair and Colin Brown scored a terrific free kick. Uh, to give us the lead and then we didn't start too well you know bluntly honest we didn't start too well and they went two goals up um, and then just something clicked again really we made a couple of changes after about an hour so then the last 25 minutes um, we got a goal with about 15 minutes to go I think it was Courtney and then from then on for the 15 minutes I just thought it was a matter of time really we had a couple of good opportunities to score prior to obviously Young Kwame going through um, on a one-on-one, -on -one. and I think you know the two-two takes us through. Um, and we were just sitting there thinking, but we're, we're way on top here. Um, and then that didn't happen. We didn't get that goal um, to get us through. And then going into the extra time again, a tight affair, and then just a lapse of concentration um, where one one of the defenders stepped up, the other one went in behind, and uh, they went clean through and scored to to make it three-one. So. Uh, yeah, it could have very easily been us going to the final um, that evening rather than uh, Exeter. I, I said this to quite a few people, but when we heard that you had been sacked or dismissed or whatever, it, we thought this is the harshest sacking in, in history. Sure, I mean, this is outrageous, but, you know, it happens, like you say, football decisions are made all the time. Yeah. Um, but you've had time to reflect now, I think, and you've just said, like, what a season that was. I mean, how disappointed were you, though, to, to sort of, for its end as it did because I think many people thought you, you'd done more than enough to deserve another crack at it yeah you do on, on reflection at the time yeah you, you, you're surprised and shocked more than anything because obviously you know we're going through the COVID times as well um, and there's a lot of people out there who are losing jobs in different industries and um, so you know I'm no different to anyone else really who's my job but I think with the job that we've done last year you know you're looking and thinking yeah we've just missed out but you know, I think it's the first time in 22 years they got into the playoffs, apart from the promotion year they had. So, um, you know, we went to Manchester United. You know, the club hadn't been in its career, Manchester United. So it was the first time they'd ever been to Man U. And, and that money probably is very important now, more than yeah, I would, I would imagine so. Yeah, you know, it was I think it was fifty or thousand there that evening. Um, mm. So again, you know, um, first time they've been to the quarterfinals in 45 years and. You know, the, the plays as well, you know, with the club, at, you know, sold in that summer. You know, you had Sammy Smoddock, Frankie Kent. Um, we started with Kane Vincent Young, but after a month, Ipswich come knocking um, and we sold him to, to Ipswich. So, you know, we'd lost three of our, you know, stand 11 and we had to, you know, change one or two things around early part of the season. We had a little bit of a slow start, but I, I think you said it earlier on, we just season after season we just kept as though we were gaining momentum 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 um, and you're looking at this season Steve's nearly trying to carry it on as such you know in around the playoffs early part of the season as well so yeah it was a little bit of a shock but again I look back at it and I think yeah it was a fantastic season and you know it's current that's the, the thing you know I'm hoping that people can see from you know other football clubs is that it's not two or three years ago of what I've done it's you know the last season you know on what I've done previous you know, you're looking at it now and thinking, yeah, it was a great season for myself, but, you know, great season for the players and the club as well yeah. as the fans. Yeah, it's, I mean, the silver lining, of course, is that, you know, you've been dismissed at a very high ebb. So, you know, all these clubs that are, are going to be looking for a manager soon. I mean, I know you've spoken to two or three already. Um, you've had some quite advanced talks with a few of them. So, I mean, 
you know, clearly your name is amongst uh, some of the, the high runners and the top runners to get these jobs. But I mean, you know, how do you feel about getting back into work now? Because, you know, you've clearly got a lot to offer. Yeah, again, I, you know, we had a conversation the other day. It's, you're looking to get back in, you, you're coming out of it, you'll have to, you know, reassess a little bit of a break. Of, you know, I've needed that bit of a break because, you know, four years, um, I, I, you know, again, 25 hours a day, eight days a week, you know, it's a full on job. Uh, even though the, the title is a head coach, you're still managing day to day with, you know, dealing with your chairman from your director of football to your players to your agents. So, you know, there's, there's no respite in that respect. And it's what you know and what you'll enjoy, really. You know, that day to day and then getting on the grass and trying to improve the plays to get them the right result for the club and the fans um, of a weekend. You know, there's, there's no better feeling than when you put a plan in action through the week and you see the rewards on a Saturday. So I think coming out of it, having that little bit of a break has been excellent. You know, I've, I've needed it. I didn't think it did at the time. I was, you know, I was saying, thinking a little bit, you know, oh, I need to get back in straight away. But I think I spoke to a, you know, a number of people who are nowhere in the game, uh, managers and one or two other ex-managers that are, you know, like George Bailey, um, ex-gaffer of mine, you know, you're just taking advice off these type of people and they're just saying, you know, when a rest does come, make sure you, you take your rest and enjoy it. And then, you know, opportunity knocks, you'd have to look at it, you know, and if it's right for you and you're giving yourself a chance of winning games of football, you know, and you feel as though you can go in there and make a difference, then that, that that's what you need to do. And I'm no different to any other manager that I want to work at the moment. Of course, I think, you know, whoever ends up uh, giving you the, the, your next job, they'll be very lucky to have you, John. Um, it's been fantastic speaking to you today. It really yeah, has. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, definitely, definitely we'll keep a very close eye on, on your career going forward because I'm sure it's going to be an exciting one for us to follow. Um, guys who have listened to this, I hope you enjoyed it. I uh, really appreciate, like I say, all you patrons out there who support D3D4 football. Uh, we'll be back on the on, on Sunday indeed to cover the Boxing Day fixtures. Uh, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and until next week it's goodbye.